All right, we are back. It is Friday, January 22nd, I believe. Yep, chapter 17, moving on. Our next chapter, uh, benzene aromaticity here, which is really another polyene, we could say. Uh, and this will only be a couple of class sessions. So I think homework two for chapter 17, it will be due next Monday. <laughs> So don't let that ruin your weekend. Hopefully you're reading ahead and keeping up on that. So um, yeah, and what we have on the overhead here, if you can pan up there briefly, we've got uh, a big sandwich, it looks like, floating around here. No, that's benzene. That's the lowest energy molecular orbital of benzene. <laughs> And we'll do the same MO treatment qualitatively here, like we did for the polyenes, but now this is cyclic with benzene, uh, and it involves, what, six atomic orbitals? So how many molecular orbitals do we need? Let's see, do you, and you see them all there. One, two, three, four, five, six, there they all are. It's cyclic, so we have some symmetry here when we look at the nodes, and we'll go back to that, but that's the low energy one where there are no nodes, they're all overlapping, and that only accommodates two electrons. So what you're familiar with, I think, is the benzene structure where all the pi electrons are in phase, but that's not all six electrons, okay? In a molecular orbital, you can only put two electrons. So we'll only put two there. The next one up is this one here. There's actually two ways to make one node. And so two electrons go there. And that's the HOMO level, the highest occupied molecular orbital level. And then there's uh, a way to put the node not through the atoms there. We have a couple non-bonding carbon atoms there you can see. So the node goes directly across the molecule like that. You can also draw that node, what, across through the bonds on the side. And that, uh, by quantum mechanics, says they have the same energy and you do the exact calculations, you can see the energies here. They are very close. <laughs> They're essentially the same energy. Then going up, more nodes, more nodes. And the top one has the max. I think there's three nodes there. <laughs> Those are the antibonding. Okay, there's no electrons in the ground state there. The electrons here are down here. Anyway, we'll use that toward the end to try to get a better handle on why benzene's stable aromaticity and why this separate chapter on benzene and what's unique about that. We saw some resonance stabilization with butadiene, right? Four to five kcals per mole. With benzene, it's going to be much more and it's going to affect things like the structure and the reactivity. And it's not just benzene. There's a whole host of other compounds that uh, fall into this category of aromatic compounds. So benzene is just one. So you're used to this, right? The cacolase structures push the electrons around the ring, two degenerate resonance structures. The true structure is a hybrid of those two, the little donut structure. Make sure you know what that means. That's C6H6 with that arrangement for that. Bond length, so oh, we talked about some bond length analysis for butadiene, and we had, what, a shorter bond between C2 and C3? It was kind of in between a double bond and a, and a pi bond, or a single bond and a, a double bond. And same thing here. All the bond lengths in benzene, carbon-carbon bond lengths, are all the same. They're all 1.39, a little bit longer than what a typical isolated alkene, which is 1.34 angstroms, right? And they're quite a bit shorter than a single bond, which is, of course, 1.54. And they're shorter still than that bond length between C2 and C3 and butadiene. That was, what, 1.49, I think. So this is significantly shorter. It has to do with that cyclic structure and this extra resonance stabilization energy. It's going to be a lot more energy. We'll do a little on nomenclature today. Well, actually, quite a bit. Sorry. <laughs> We've got uh, a wide variety of aromatic compounds, and you'll have to know some of these common names. These become the parent names by the IUPAC rule. So here they are summarized. We'll go through them on the board. Now, when we have more than one substituent on benzene, uh, we have disubstituted benzene. They can be 1-2 to each other. It's called ortho, 1-3 uh, meta, or 1-4 para substitution. Those are common terms for the 
the positions relative between two groups on, on benzene. Prefix names, phenyl, which is that benzene group, or benzyl, if it's a phenyl methyl group. So that benzyl prefix name is a little bit funny. It means a phenyl methyl. It's actually a seven carbon prefix, okay? So yeah, you can use those as prefix names in more complex structures for naming. Uh, I draw out some of them here, and we'll go to the board and do some of these too. You probably remember phenol from uh, 351. Maybe not toluene, that's methylbenzene. If you call it methylbenzene, we know what you mean, but toluene's the accepted parent name now for that. Cetophenone, uh, that's where you have a methyl ketone and a benzene. Cetophenone, that's kind of a compli complicated, so, but you see the acetyl group, and that's what this is, right? And phenone, it ends in O-N-E, so it's a ketone. So parts of the name will help you out to keep them straight, I think. Benzaldehyde, of course, an aldehyde. Styrene, that's kind of a funny one, but it relates to polystyrene and stuff. We'll say a little bit about the NMR ring current and the deshielding effect that uh, in the proton NMR we see hydrogens on aromatic systems are shifted way downfield. They're way, what, uh, deshielded more exposed to the magnetic field, so they have a higher than expected uh, shift value. Yeah, stability, look at that, 35 kcals per mole resonance energy, okay, <laughs> by being aromatic and in a ring like that. So it's a special type of polyene with extra stabilization. Remember, we said that resonance stabilization of butadiene was only four to, to, four to six kcals per mole. Well, this is many uh, times higher than that. And the reactivity, we'll talk about that in a second here at the board to show how it's going to be different. Aromaticity, we'll define that exactly. It doesn't have to do with the smell, <laughs> like the name implies, but a lot of these do have different odors to them. <laughs> That's where the term actually comes from originally, from benzoin gum materials from the Middle East, frankincense and myrrh, <laughs> and these nice smelling compounds. A lot of those are aromatic compounds. I'll show you a lot of aromatic compounds in a second, but we define aromaticity precisely in organic chemistry as, as this here, following the Huckel rule, Edwin Huckel, who came up with this, an aromatic compound has to have a continuous cyclic array of conjugated p-atomic orbitals, it has to be planar, fully conjugated, and it has to be 4n plus 2 pi electrons to be considered aromatic, where n is any integer from 0 on up. So the magic numbers are 2, 6, 10, 14, 18, 22, going up in that mathematical progression. All the other combinations of pi electrons will not be aromatic. In fact, some, if they're constrained to be flat and they don't have that 4n plus 2 number of electrons and they're flat constrained, they can actually be anti-aromatic and be much higher in energy strain-wise. Okay. So it's kind of a weird thing there, but the Huckel rule helps us figure that out. So whether it's aromatic or not, whether it's anti-aromatic or non-aromatic, if it doesn't meet some of this criteria, we'll go through a lot of examples, don't worry. Aromatic compounds uh, can be bigger than benzene, the anulenes, they can be polycyclic, like naphthalene, you see here with two benzenes fused, anthracene with three, phenanthrene, and they can be charged. We'll see some ions that actually can meet the Huckel rule and be stable enough that you can isolate them and even put some in a bottle, okay? So being neutral has nothing to do with the Huckel rule. Uh, and yeah, we'll see some variations of it. And another reason why we cover this are the heterocycles. So parole, pyridine, here's a couple of them here, furan, imidazole, purine, and the pyrimidines, which are in DNA, the purines and pyrimidines, ATGC, right, adenosine, thymidine, uh, guanine, cytosine, those bases on the side of the ribose in DNA and RNA are also aromatic. So we'll have to talk about those structures a little bit there. And yeah, the theoretical basis here for why these things are so stable, what's so unique about aromatic things is the Huckel rule. And we'll use this frost circle approximation to see how that works. That simplifies the, the, uh, the theoretical basis for that and, and gives more of a more of a basis for why this 4n plus 2 rule holds up. Okay, so yeah, why aromatic compounds? Well, they're all over the place, including chocolate. <laughs> uh, and Valentine's Day is coming up, so I thought I'd throw in a little chocolate discussion. 
And you see a bunch of aromatic compounds uh, for the flavor of chocolate, which is a very complex material, right? Coming out of the plant, you've got a process of whatever. Over 300 compounds in there, okay? And so here's just some of them. Vanillin, maltol, uh, pyrazine. This is that potato chip flavored compound, which is kind of a cool compound. <laughs> now I have a cinnamate here, and this one is vinyl thiazole here. So that's a complex heterocycle. The texture of chocolate is the fatty, unctuous feel in the mouth that we like. And that's an acyl triglyceride, which has the long chain fatty esters you've probably heard about. And then, yeah, why do we crave chocolate? Well, some of these compounds are biological active. active. There's tiny amounts of these. The common one in chocolate is theobromine which is one methyl away from being caffeine, okay? Theobromine is also a stimulant. And some of these, serotonin, that's a neurotransmitter for us, okay? That's one of the feel-good neurotransmitters. Uh, this is also a phenethylamine, and this one right here is one methyl group away from being methamphetamine a very potent stimulant. <laughs> then in andamides, the endogenous uh, ligand that hits the uh, cannabinol receptor in the brain. The cannabinol receptors were discovered using dihydro and hydrocannabinol, which come from what? Marijuana. So this endogenous ligand here is again a feel-good neurotransmitter, which is kind of unique. Anyway, in drugs, we see a lot of aromatic structures. I think all these drugs up here have aromatic uh, groups except one. Can you find the one that's not aromatic? <laughs> you see the benzene rings all over the place in Taxol, Zandy's got a couple of them. ACT, that's the aromatic thymidine, which is like uh, the, the, the DNA RNA base pair. Penicillin has an aromatic. Which one doesn't? Oh, it's this one, FK506. Okay, you can't see an aromatic group there, but they're very common. Uh, all over the place. And, you know, it's not just benzene, but there's variations like this, naphthalene with two hooked together. And I like to show the stick drawing as well as the space filling thing. So you get a feel for these guys. They're flat, okay? Continuous, you know, uh, conjugated pi electrons. And here's one where uh, pyridine, we take out a CH group and we add in a pyridine, which has a lone pair coming off here, five valence electrons, right, for nitrogen. But it still has the pi bond here. It's sp2 hybridized, just like all the carbons. So yeah, pyridine is an important aromatic compound. It's basic. It has a lone pair there. It can function as a base. That's a little bit different structure than benzene. It's a little bit flatter down here, right, with the nitrogen. That dark blue, maybe you can't see that too good. Quinoline is the uh, variation of that with an extra benzene there, uh, which is also common. The other thing about benzene, and this is a, a fundamental thing that Kekulé and the early chemists struggled with, figuring out the structure, okay? Kekulé, you know, we have his resonance structures. That will, that's where we'll start. And part of the evidence for this were the number of isomers for dichlorobenzene, which was known they could isolate these, okay, based on their physical properties. They didn't know the full structure, but they said because there's only three here, it must be some sort of cyclic structure where they can be together or one away or two away like that, okay? So that accounts for some of the structure. And again, this is the ortho, meta, and para variation. And you see the shapes are quite different with the big uh, chlorides being there. So we'll talk about these, these isomeric variations. What goes on there? Here's some more of the heterocycles. Here's parole, which will be a little different than pyridine. Pyridine is a six-membered guy. This is a five-membered one. Uh, this has a hydrogen on it, an NH group there. There's a lone pair on nitrogen here, which is in a P orbital, which is part of the aromatic hextet, six pi electrons. <laughs> so we'll again, have to look at the structure. That's, that's what you can, uh, can fall back on always in OCHEM, examining the structure carefully. Thiophene, there's two lone pairs there, right? Sulfur's right below, below oxygen in the periodic table, so there's two lone pairs here like oxygen. So are both lone pair electrons, those four electrons included in the aromatic grouping? No, this is hybridized as sp2. One lone pair is sp2, the other is in a p orbital which makes it aromatic, okay? So we'll have to analyze these a little bit. And then it's all the two nitrogens. 
That's also in an amino acid. A lot of these aromatic structures are in the amino acids also. The amino acid that has imidazole, anybody know what it is? Anybody remember your amino acid structures? You will soon for this class. Histidine. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Someone knew that histidine. So, yeah, these aromatic structures are all over the place here. Uh, let's start the uh, discussion about the stability here. And this is from the heat of hydrogenation experiment that we can do and compare here. Now we can measure how many kcals per mole come out of these reactions very precisely using calorimetry. There's a bath of water with a known amount of water. We know the heat capacity of water. The reaction's done in a little bomb that transfers all the heat that's generated in the reaction to the water. You measure the change in the water. Don't, don't worry about the experimental setup at all. It's the energies here. And we've talked about this with butadiene before. A simple isolated alkene when it's hydrogenated is about 30 kcals per mole exothermic. Okay? And so we're starting materials here. When we hydrogenate with palladium, hydrogen, we get out this amount of heat. Okay? Now, if we have a conjugated cyclic structure here of a diene, Look, we don't get out two times this. We get out a little bit less, right? It's not quite 60 or 58. You know, it's 55. And why is that? Well, this is resonance conjugation stability, which lowers the suspected energy for a diene, okay? Conjugated diene is going to be a little more stable than an isolated diene, okay? So we get about a little bit less heat there. We saw that before. So hopefully that's making some sense from chapter 16, right? Now, the benzene, is it a triene, a cyclic triene that's isolated? Or is it this crazy, more stable aromatic structure that we now know it is? So this would be the expected thing if this were a true isolated triene. We'd expect to get three times this 28.6, which would be about 82 kcals per mole, okay? Estimated. And you can estimate that theoretically, too, if you knock out the conjugation overlap here. But I'm not going into the details of that. But here's the true experiment. If you do the experiment, hydrogenate benzene, you need a more active catalyst than palladium. You need to use a rhodium catalyst, but you can hydrogenate benzene. Excess hydrogen, the more active catalyst, like I said. But look, you only get out about 50 kcals per mole heat. So why is that? How come it's not 80? Well, this lower energy, here's this resonance energy, estimated to be about, what, 33 kcals per mole? That's lower than the theoretical isolated triene, okay? Questions on this graphic? I know it's a little bit complicated. There's a few reactions there, but the consequence is this resonance stabilization energy, which is lowering the actual energy of benzene relative to a theoretical isolated Trying. Yes, please. Yeah, so someone's asking about if we draw the energy diagram. Uh, notice these end up at the same product. So the issue is, you know, where do they start? And the person's asking about, I think, the transition state. And, and why the more active catalyst? Yeah, so this is in a lower potential energy well, and to come out of that well, you have to go over a higher kinetic barrier. So this graphic here says nothing about kinetics right now. It's just the overall, uh, comparing the theoretical heat of hydrogenation to the actual here, okay? And this stabilization energy is seen in the difference between these two numbers here, but yeah. Yeah, the actual setup of the experiment, it can be done a couple different ways, and, and it can be done uh, theoretically as well with calculations. And they're in good agreement that this resonance stabilization energy for benzene, making it a lower ground state energy to begin with, is, is about 35 kcals per mole. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll get to this here in a second. Let's go to the board now and talk about <clears throat> some of the reactivity here of benzene, uh, yeah, and yeah. So here we have, you know, the Kikolay structures. And that's, you know, where, where Kikolay started was C6H6. <laughs> they knew the empirical formula for benzene. They didn't know the structure. <laughs> and Auguste Kikolay said, well, it's highly unsaturated. We know some other compounds like C6H12 
which is actually what? Cyclohexane. Uh, so what's benzene? Well, you know, it's six less hydrogens. <laughs> In fact, the ratio of atoms is just CH. <laughs> And, and so this is confusing to them. It, it must be highly unsaturated. Well, they said, okay, uh, so he came up with a structure. Well, let's put it in a ring and have three double bonds there. And notice he could say, well, these are just moving around. And, and that's what he used to talk about. These were moving around the ring, uh, the six pi electrons, right? And, you know, we didn't have hybridization of the structure yet. But they were starting to draw lines for different structures. They knew that carbon had a valency of four. So they were beginning to link up atoms at this point. Uh, but later on, um, Pauling says, no, these are all just in one molecular orbital. So they were beginning to use molecular orbital theory. These aren't actually moving. All six of these are in a donut type structure. All the p-atomic orbitals are in phase like this. Okay, so the model comparing, and that's what you're familiar with, right? So are all six of the pi electrons in this orbital? No, we'll have to come up with the array of six molecular orbitals. But the donut structure is commonly drawn like this. And make sure you know what it is. It's a hybrid composite of the two localized resonance structures, right? Okay, and make sure that you know that that does not equal this. <laughs> okay, when we draw that donut, we don't mean this. It's not cyclohexaene. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that would be uh, what? Just C6. <laughs> That's not what we're drawing. That would be highly strained. That's a theoretical molecule. <laughs> what we're drawing here is where each carbon, you know, has a hydrogen on it, C6H6. Okay, but we'll need to get into this a little bit more. Yes. Yeah, it's the stability thing, but why? You know, why is it so stable? It's got the six pi electrons, can all be in a phase here. We'll have to go to Huckel theory. And then the frost circles have figured out. Uh, Kekulé and the early guys knew about this stuff too, this different type of reactivity. So here you have a typical alkene, you can brominate it. And that reaction is very fast. We did that in 351, right? Alkene, dibrom, bromination with Br2. Very fast reaction, okay? Well, if benzene's a bunch of alkenes, let's treat it with bromine too. And it turns out, here's this potential energy well that's stabilizing it, making it so there's no reaction. Well, that caused quite a bit of angst. <laughs> it's a fly in the ointment of their theory, right? Because if it's unsaturated, maybe it's alkene-like. How come it doesn't react the same as a simple alkene? Well, they didn't uh, give up. They said, well, if we treat bromine, but with a Lewis acid, with iron tribromide, ferric bromide, look, we do get it to brominate, but it's mono bromo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not dibromo. They may have expected this, right? How come it didn't give this? Or polybromo, whatever. No, it gives back the aromatic benzene ring and only monobromate. So it's obviously different, and that's uh, you know part of why we, we need to have a separate uh, separate chapter here uh, for this. Now let's look at this too. So let's have dibromo benzene. <clears throat> let's put a second one on there, and we'll we'll show you how to do that later. But let's consider that resonance structure and this one. Now, why am I pointing this out? What might be the issue here for early chemists to think about between those two resonance structures, orthodibromobenzene? Do you see it? What do you think they worried about structurally? They were worrying about the structure early on. Yeah. Yeah. So is this a pi bond? And notice this resonance structure, what's this? That looks like a sigma bond. <laughs> but no, we know, you know, it's the donut structure, right? So it's going to be like this, and they're going to be the same. And MO theory will speak to that. Early on, they tried to isolate two different ortho isomers. They said, are these isomers? <laughs> are they just going around the ring very fast? And if they are going around the fat ring very fast, how fast are they going? 
And I actually tried that and, and all the theory fell through. It was always just the one compound. These aren't two compounds, okay? It's just the one compound. Uh, and then MO theory uh, and the frost circles and what we'll show you kind of nails that down. But at first, you know, that's, that's what they were going on there. All right, let's get into nomenclature. Do enough of this and see there. So, yeah, benzene is often uh, the parent. But when we start to add substituents on here, this becomes a new parent. This is toluene. Don't say methylbenzene. Okay, call it toluene. That's what it is. <laughs> Has a higher boiling point than benzene, different properties. It's a little more electron rich than benzene. It will add a second group a little bit differently, a little bit different reactivity than benzene. But that's the new parent. The IUPAC accepts these parents now. So the naming, we can put different groups on toluene. Then we need some numbers. But know these parents now. Naphthalene, this guy. And that's a nice one to know because uh, it's got a word where you got pH and TH right next to each other. I think <laughs> you got to stick your tongue out to say it. It's kind of hard with a mask on, I guess. Naphthalene. Okay. Uh, mothballs. Okay. Maybe you've been in your grandmother's closet to protect the wool fabrics, whatever. <laughs> Keep the moths at bay. Uh, naphthalene. Um, how about this one? And this kind of points out where these things come from. Benzoin gums, this is benzoic acid. That whole thing, that, that's the new parent, benzoic acid, okay? And the other thing here, when we do number these with multiple groups on these parents, whatever the group is for the parent there is always implied to be number one for the benzoic acid. Everything else is relative to that position. Then we got benzaldehyde. And these come out of the, uh, the benzoin gums. I won't draw aldehyde. You can if you want. That whole thing is benzaldehyde. <laughs> now, benzyl alcohol. And that's where that prefix term comes from. Benzyl alcohol. Um, this whole group right here, if you use it as a prefix name, that's a benzyl group. Okay, if you want to use it as a substituent. But if you have this methyl alcohol on the side of a benzene, you can call the whole thing benzyl alcohol. Okay, that should make some sense. And then we got these guys. You have two methyls there. This is xylene. And this is drawn as the ortho variation. There's also meta. And I think you can tell what meta xylene would be. It's where the methyls move down and they're one three to each other. And I think you can also see para uh, if you move down here. There's only three isomers of xylene, okay? You might say, well, what if we move the methyl over here? Well, that's still 1,3. That's still uh, metaxylene, okay? Uh, yeah, there's a few of them. Uh, styrene, I already showed you that. <laughs> Let's get into a couple more and do a couple more that are a little harder maybe. And then we got some ones that have extra functionality on them. Maybe you've heard about that one before. It's an aldehyde. The essence of what flavor? Starts with a C. Cinnamon, yes, yeah, cinnamaldehyde. I won't draw the whole thing, but cinnamaldehyde there. Uh, vanillin, the essence of vanilla, is methoxyhydroxy. Uh, benzaldehyde, but this whole thing here has its own parent name, vanillin, and that's a complicated one, the essence of vanilla. Like I said, you could call it methoxyhydroxy uh, benzaldehyde, but you see it's got three substituents on it, okay? So a little bit different there. Uh, this one you already know, I think. <laughs> What's that one? Starts with a P. What is it? Phenol. Yep, phenol. Notice it's not called benzyl alcohol. It's the C6 one with the alcohol directly on the benzene ring. So don't call it benzyl alcohol. That's phenol. Okay. 
Benzyl alcohol is different there, right? Then we got acetophenone. Uh, yeah, that one a little more complicated. Um, then we got the essence of licorice, <laughs> which is methoxybenzene. If you call it methoxybenzene, we know what you mean, but there's an accepted IUPAC parent name for this. It's anisole. It's the essence of licorice. You like licorice. This is what you like. Okay. Uh, anisole. Uh, and then there's this one, aniline. A couple of these uh, nitrogen compounds. Aniline dyes um, are amino benzenes. Okay, aniline is the accepted. So yeah, that's the accepted parent. So all of these that we're drawing up here are the parent names uh, for these uh, for these guys. All right, let's do some naming where we've got multiple substituents on a parent. Let's see. So we can have a couple here. Let's see, where's my big eraser? There it is. <laughs> Only got one in here now. Okay, let's see. Uh, where we use the parent, and oftentimes it's, you know, the key thing is identifying the parent and then figuring out what we're going to call it. Oh, and there's a prefix one, NO2, that maybe you remember. I think we've mentioned it a couple times. What's that? What's NO2 prefix name? Nitro? Yeah. So we got nitro what? We've got methyl benzene. So what's the parent here? It's not benzene. Sometimes benzene is a parent, but yeah, toluene. So that's what we call it. Toluene. And sometimes, you know, when you're starting out, circle that parent so you know what it is. And that implies that the number one position is where that methyl group is making it that parent. You don't need to number it as one toluene. Okay. Well, what we need to number is what's relative to that three nitro. Okay, so three nitro toluene would be the name of that. There's only two substituents, so we could also call it what? Instead of three, we could call it meta with M or meta written out, doesn't matter. Okay, but this is the parent, okay, toluene. Uh, how about this one? Fluoro ketone benzene, or what is it? Is there a parent? Look in here, acetophenone. Yeah, so there's the parent. And that implies the one position here. So where is fluoro? It's four fluoro. Four fluoro acetophenone would give you that name. Okay, how about this one? And now we've got three. So the, the key here is you can't switch over uh, and use uh, ortho meta para here. Notice they're relative to each other. They're all, you know, meta to each other. If you look at the relationship there <laughs> around the ring, or they're, they're, they're one, three, five to each other. <laughs> what are we gonna name this? What's the parent here? Do you see a IUPAC parent name in here? Nitrobenzene's not, terp-butylbenzene's not, but what about aminobenzene? Yeah, that's what, starts with an A. Aniline, yep. So aniline, and that implies that's number one. Ah, now we've got a problem, right? What is it? Terp-butyl is also meta to this one position or three to it. This is also three, the nitro. <laughs> What's going to break the tie here? What do we have to resort to? <laughs> if we're tied, what do we have to get, do then? Alphabet. Okay. So all the other substituents, alkyl, halo, nitro, anything else that's a prefix is just alphabetized. And then the highest in the alphabet gets the lower number. So, oh, this is another problem though. Is it, or do we alphabetize by T-butyl, by the T or by the B? 
by the B. <laughs> yeah, and then nitro by that. So what is this? This is three, five. So uh, what is it? Three terp butyl, uh, five nitro aniline. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. <clears throat> One more. It's a little more complicated. Let's say, how about this one? It's got benzene, got an ethyl, a nitro again, and a fluoro. Now, is there a parent there? A non-benzene named parent, I guess we could say. No. So what are we going to call this? What are we going to name this as? Benzene. Okay. Benzene can be the parent. Okay. Now, what do we need to do? We got three substituents. This is going to be ethyl, nitrofluoro, whatever, alphabetized. But what about the numbering? We can start anywhere on the numbering, right? But what's the rule numbering on a chain? It's the lowest overall numbering sequence. So what would that be? One, three, four. One, four, five, one, two, four. That would be the good one, right? So hopefully you can see it's this numbering sequence. And now we alphabetize. It's not by the numbers, right? The prefix is in the front of a name, according to IEPAC rules. We're kind of reviewing all those. Hopefully you remember some of 351. So it would be the first one here. Uh, three, what, Ethel? E comes before F, right? <laughs> and then F, I think, one fluoro. And then, uh, what is it, two nitro? Sorry, I ran out of room. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, yeah, E, F, and numbering. Yeah, a couple questions. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Very good. That's why you're here. <laughs> catch my mistakes, right? <laughs> I'm not infallible. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so definitely. Yeah, we came up with that lowest number. One, two, this is a three position. You're right. And this is four. Yeah, we had that wrong. There. So yeah, four ethyl. Notice we're not putting the numbers in order here in the front. We're putting what the alphabet in order. Okay. And this is an example where benzene is the thing. And when we have more than two substituents, we can't use ortho meta para. Here we could have said uh, para fluoroacetophenone. That would have been fine. Here we can't do it because we have three substituents. We have to use the numbering. And then same thing here, that one. And I think that, oh, one more. <laughs> I always like this one. This tends to uh, catch your attention a little bit, maybe. What's that? <laughs> can we do the nam naming of that? Or can we just jump to the acronym that you know? What is it? What's this compound? What's that? Trinitrotoluene. And what would be the numbering? Two, four, six. Two, four, six trinitrotoluene. What's the acronym that you already know? What? <laughs> the explosive material, okay. uh, TNT. Maybe we'll talk more about the properties of that later, do the uh, substitution. Later. All right, let's get into the precise definition of aromaticity now. So yeah, nomenclature, you know, it's not a big deal. It's an artificial thing just to keep track of the structure. I like doing enough nomenclature so that you keep track of structure. <laughs> that's, that's the main reason why we do nomenclature is just to help you identify structural differences, keep track of things that can be reactivity difference and property differences, right? But let's get into this aromaticity idea. What does that mean exactly? On the early days, some of these gums smelled nice that had benzoic acid and benzaldehyde and cinnamaldehyde in them. But this precise definition has more to do now with the structure 
the stability and the reactivity of these molecules, okay? So let's see, what do we have to have? We have to have a continuous uh, cyclic uh, array of pi electrons, okay? Uh, so these are from p atomic orbitals. It has to be flat, okay, or planar, okay? And that's what we're getting out of that. If these are p atomic orbitals, uh, a lot of times then the carbons and even the heteroatoms uh, are what? sp2 hybridized. We can have some intervening sp hybridization, but we'll count those electrons differently. But typically it's sp2 hybridization, what? To have the p atomic orbitals. And it has to be cyclic, a cyclic array, a ribbon, if you will. And benzene's the typical one, right, with six there. But now here's the here's the rub. <laughs> According to Huckel, we need four n plus two pi electrons. And what does this mean? So it's a mathematical progression. Four n plus two, where n is any integer from zero on up. Okay. So what does this 4n plus 2 then come out to be? It comes out to be, let's see, if n is 0, what is the magic number of aromatic electrons? 2. If n is 1, what is it? 6. If n is 2, plug it in there. What's that going to be? 10. 14. So you see it goes up skipping by, by 4 each, right? On up. Okay. So What's magical about this? So if it meets these two criteria, we're going to call the compound aromatic. Okay. Let's see if we're missing some of this. If in number one missing, okay. Um, you know, if it's not cyclic, if it's not continuous, if it's not conjugated. By continuous, we mean conjugated. We ought to put that there. Yeah. Uh, if it's not conjugate, if there's an intervening sp3 hybridized carbon, or it's not flat, or any of these criteria here, we're going to call it, what, uh, non-aromatic. Okay. Now, if, uh, if, let's see, well, yeah, anything in number one missing. So let's say everything in number one, okay including flat, continuous, and that's kind of the key here uh, for this flat. But number two is out, okay? If instead it has four, eight, 12, et cetera, electrons, and it's flat, continuous, what are we gonna call that? We're gonna call that anti-aromatic. <laughs> And they're going to be actually very high in energy and very unstable. Non-aromatic ones, there's a lot of non-aromatic compounds, right? They don't have a continuous flat pi array, whatever. There's a lot of them. There's a lot in this category. There's some here, and there's very few in this category, anti-aromatic. But we'll see by going through the examples uh, today. we got time. We'll do a few uh, more here, and we'll, we'll see that. The other criteria now for aromatic compounds. If anything aromatic on the side will be de-shielded. And you'll see that in the proton NMR. And I'll review that next time, I think. Let's jump ahead to some of the uh, compounds now and talk about some of them in general. And let's have this criteria. Oh, sorry, I wrote it on the non-movable board. But yeah, have this in your notes. Make sure you have this clear. We'll apply this now to uh, some compounds, okay? <clears throat> and we'll start with the simplest ones here. Let's start with uh, uh, compounds related to benzene, like this one, cyclobutadiene. And you might say, well, that's flat, continuous, conjugated, planar. Constrained to be five. It's got some angle strain issues to it, <laughs> but it turns out what? That's four pi electrons. Does that fit the Huckel rule, four n plus two? No. The number of electrons there are two, six, ten, skipping over four. 
So what do we call this here? And it's flat, whatever, that'll be anti-aromatic. In fact, this compound's never been made before or isolated. It's a theoretical molecule. Whereas this molecule has been made, cyclooctatetraene, cot. This has been made. It has the cyclic array uh, uh, of electrons. It turns out it's not flat. And there's another little bit of data here. In the proton NMR, these resonate at uh, 5.8 ppm, which is not in the aromatic range. The aromatic range is 7 ppm, okay? And this actual structure here turns out not to be flat. It's puckered. It adopts this tub-shaped structure, <laughs> okay? <laughs> And actually the bond lengths here are different going around the ring. Um, the, each of the individual alkenes are 1.33 angstroms. And all of the sides here are actual true single bonds. In cot, they're closer to 1.54. Well, they're 1.46. Being in a ring, they're a little bit shorter. But the X-ray structure of that is known and it adopts this tub-shaped structure. It's not flat. If it were constrained to be flat, It'd be anti-aromatic. So what do we call cot? It's non-aromatic, okay? So that's the bottom line there. What do we call this one? Anti-aromatic, okay? This one in a special form has been made. <laughs> the tetraterbutyl one has been made. Low temperature, near zero degrees Kelvin in a solid matrix, and it still only lasted for a short amount of time. But they were able to get the X-ray structure. This bond here is like 1.51. This bond here is like 1.38. So again, uh, getting the Huckel rule straight is a, is a key thing here. All right, how about this compound? Cyclohepta. Triene. Hopefully I drew that good. <laughs> Aromatic or not? Apply all the criteria there. Yeah, a lot of people shaking their head this way. Why? What's the exception here? It's got an intervening sp3 hybridized carbon, methylene. So it's not a continuous cyclic array, even though it has six pi electrons. Okay. So that we would say is non-aromatic. Ah, but if we react this with this molecule here, triphenyl methyl cation uh, tetrafluoroborate. You can actually react it with that molecule right there. It's a stable cation. And what it does to cycloheptatriene is it pulls off a hydride. It pulls off that hydrogen with its pair of electrons. And what does it give you? It gives you this molecule here. <laughs> That's called tropilium cation. Tropilium cation you can put in a bottle. It's so stable. You can take the NMR of tropilium cation. And guess what? All seven of these hydrogen on the side resonate at about seven ppm. <laughs> so what is tropilium cation? Is it aromatic? It's flat, continuous. Ah, but it's got a charge. Notice the Huckel rule stuff said nothing about the number of atoms in the continuous ring. It said nothing about charge. What it has it has to be flat, continuous, and that magic number of electrons. How many pi electrons? One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, it's got the six. It's the same as benzene, but it is a cation. Now you can resonate this and put the plus charge anywhere around the ring, or you can just abbreviate it like this. <laughs> you can draw a seven-membered ring. Hopefully I can do that and just say plus. And that's the resonance structure, the stable aromatic thing of tropilium cation. And it comes from this hydride abstraction using the, uh, the cation there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so the person just said, yeah, if we lose the hydride with its pair of electrons, so then we're leaving behind a plus charge there. 
Yeah, so this becomes SP2 hybridized now. It was SP3, right? And so that's an empty P orbital, but these are all P atomic orbitals too. We can kind of draw the thing there. And we're out of time. We'll, <laughs> we'll do a couple other charts things. We'll do the heterocyclic ones, and we'll do the frost circle MO thing on Monday. But I think we'll have enough time to finish up Chapter 17, so be reading ahead and, and get that down, and we'll see you next time. Very good. Thank you.